Hello, and thank you for coming to the YouTube channel. We've got a great story today called The People's Congressman about Omer Madison Kem, a little-known story in American politics. I'm your narrator, Chris Christensen. This is my YouTube channel, and I'm the great-great-grandson of populist congressman Omer Madison Kem. So I'm proud to uh, tell his story today. This story was written by Deloitte John Guth when he was a uh, um, a master's student in Creighton University. So please like and subscribe, most importantly, so we can provide you lots more of this content. And let's go ahead and start the story of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman by Deloyd John Guth. Where's our title page? Here we go. Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman, narrated by Chris Christensen, written by Deloyd John Guth. This is a thesis that was submitted to the faculty of the Graduate School of the Creighton University in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Master of Arts in the Department of History in Omaha, 1962. Preface The personal aspect of the rise and fall of the populist movement in the United States deserves far better than its present oversimplified, almost forgotten historical status. At best, the populist of the 1890s has often been pictured as an uncultured hayseed, an opportunist, who did little but stir up a new brand of radicalism in support of reforms which have since been credited to the progressives. In a very real sense, we have built up our own image of what a populist was, despite the fact that little has actually been done to establish and document the men themselves, their backgrounds, their personal reasons of their radicalism, and the course which they followed once their crusade had collapsed. Rather, the historian too frequently has chosen to take the easy way out by furthering the tabloid associated with Pitchfork Ben Tillman, Sockless Jerry Simpson, and Hell-Raising Mary Lease. As a result, the image has stayed, but the humanity of the individuals is all but destroyed. Most significant of all, the state of Nebraska, where populism found its greatest strength, has all but completely forgotten its heritage of radicalism. As a microcosm for the movement, Nebraska contributed heavily to the origins, growth, and demise of the Populist Party. In so doing, the state gave its sons to the cause in unlimited numbers by virtue of its predominantly rural population, which decided in 1890 that it had to take matters into its own hands to prevent being choked off both politically and economically, in the national rush towards industrial capitalism. Omer Madison Kem was one of these men who, though long forgotten, gave his all in an attempt to save the agrarian from destruction. He was a prime mover in Nebraska populism and a three-term populist congressman. General Kem represented the old way of life, frontier agrarian in its struggle against the new, mechanized, and materialistic industrialism. His short political career, coupled with his poverty-stricken pursuit of a farm vocation, was an attempt to save this birthright in the face of a society which was seemingly determined to destroy it. The story of Omer Madison Kem's early years was often repeated in the lives of other 19th century Western farmers, but it has rarely been told in all of its personal ramifications. In some ways, this red-headed, calamity-howling sodbuster matched the historian's image of the populace, but in other ways he did not. It behooves Nebraskans to recall again his story. The saga of Omer Madison Kem was that of the Western agrarian who, because of a family tradition of farming, struck out alone in search for new and better land opportunities. Born in Indiana, he soon followed the receding American frontier, settling on a homestead in Nebraska in 1882. But new and serious problems arose for the frontier farmers, threatening their destruction. The cause of woe, as Kem and the others saw it, lay in a society which ignored the producer while exploiting his product. The result of the agrarian reaction was populism, and in this, Omer Madison Kem soon took the lead on the local level in the farmer's fight for political recognition and economic salvation. The crusade carried him into the halls of Congress, but once there, Kem found that he was but a voice crying out in a wilderness of special interests. Omer Madison Kem had never learned to compromise his convictions with reality. 
As a result, he fast became a successful failure as a politician. Omar Kem did not stoop, he did not conquer. In this master's thesis, the author presents the story of Omar Madison Kem's struggle in its entirety. This would not have been possible, however, without an access to the personal memoirs of the man himself. For this, the author acknowledges his lasting obligation to Mr. Claude Julian Kem, the eldest surviving son of Omer Madison Kem. It is he who first answered the author's plea for information, and it is he, along with his charming wife, who so graciously took the author into their confidence and their home in Cottage Grove, Oregon. As a result, the voluminous personal documents have been placed at the disposal of the author, thereby making this biography a reality. In addition, the unlimited cooperation of Omer Madison Kem's widow, Mrs. Alice Maria Kem, and of his daughter, M Mrs. McKinley Carr, has proved invaluable in ascertaining many facts relative to Congressman Kem's political career. But acquiring the necessary information is one thing, and producing a finished product of scholarship and significance is another. For this, there is but one man to thank. Dr. Frank L. Byrne has never failed this student in encouraging, aiding, and giving direction to the work necessary for the completion of this study. He has given freely of both his time and his academic experience, and without him, the research and writing of this thesis would have been something less than an enjoyable experience. Lastly, acknowledgement is due to all the members of the Department of History of the Creighton University who have suffered through thick and thin with Omer Kem, never failing to lend a helping hand when needed. Most important in this regard, the chairman, Dr. Arthur G. Umshide, has always extended encouragement and understanding to this student in unlimited amounts. Chapter 1, The Cultivation of an Agrarian The hot Nebraska sun shone high, bright, and unmercifully on the trampled and arid roadways leading in to Cedar Rapids from the outlying farm areas of Boone County. In ordinary circumstances, September 1, 1890 would have found only a handful of farmers in town, for the harvest time should have kept them busy in the fields. But on this day, the streets of Cedar Rapids had been filled to overflowing by a dusty, milling mass of farm men and women who had gathered near a wagon platform. They had no reason to be in the fields. There were no crops to harvest. For three months, the dry dust of drought had blown roughshod over central and western Nebraska, leaving withered crops and parched sod in its waterless wake. Men whose entire lives and fortunes had been tied to the soil now stood destitute in the streets, with their hunger for economic salvation burning through their bronzed and weather-worn countenances. By the month of September, they had gotten used to breathing and biting the desiccating grist of wind-blown sand, and the powdered grime had long been accepted as a household accoutrement. They and their earth thirsted for nature's relief, but it had not been forthcoming. Redemption from drought had not come from up above, so today these agrarians had answered the call of the Farmers' Alliance, hoping that a panacea from their peers might bring deliverance. Within a few short moments, the man who personified salvation strode to the wagon platform erected in the center of town, and the huge crowd burst forth with the songs and chants of rural discontent. Their hero, 34-year-old Omer Madison Kem, looked no different from most of the men gathered in the street. He had flaming red hair, a large handlebar mustache, clean but overworked farm clothes, and the same weather-toughened and grimly serious exterior. But today he had assumed the role of a second John the Baptist, making straight the way for a long-awaited agricultural salvation. In the eyes of the farmers, he had become the voice of one crying in an agrarian desert, pleading for their support in the coming congressional election. As soon as the president of the, of the local alliance had made the formal introduction, this farmer from Broken Bow, some 100 miles southwest of Cedar Rapids, launched into a two-hour and 15-minute speech. He attacked the prevailing tariff policy, the exploitation of the farmers by their railroads, the land policy which bred the eastern speculator and the mortgage company, 
and the Republican combination with the British syndicates, which had destroyed the money supply. The drought had only been the straw which broke the farmer's back, finally awakening him to the evils inherent in government by Eastern money. This concatenation of evils had brought the series of farm hardships which had culminated in nature's devastating intervention in 1890. Candidate Kemp's only answer lay in a concerted uprising of the farmers which would send him to Washington to plead their case. They must once more seize the reins of government, thereby destroying the power of the moneyed interests. In answer to Kemp's impassioned appeal, the sodbusters shouted a chorus of Amen, Brother Kemp, Amen. And Omer Medicine Kemp replied by waving his own farm mortgage as a pledge of fealty to the interests of his people. For the farmer's man of the hour, the trip from a sod house near Broken Bow, Nebraska to the House of Representatives on the shores of the Potomac would be long and arduous. Omer Madison Cam had never known a vocation other than farming, and his rural background was the only basis on which he could campaign. Yet, for the farmers standing under the hot sun in the dusty streets of Cedar Rapids, and for all those gathered along the campaign trail of 1890, simply being a farmer was an important qualification to hold office. For the red-headed homesteader, this campaign marked the culmination of a lifetime spent in pursuance of agricultural success. In this sense, Omer Kemp personified both the ideals and realities of Western rural life in the latter half of the 19th century. His election in 1890 marked the final chapter in a family genealogy which ran the gamut of the story of agrarianism on the American frontier. The saga of Omer Kim's rural ancestors had become just before excuse me, had begun just before the Revolutionary War when his great grandparents, George and Elizabeth Kim, left London for America. Although George Kim had been a skilled coachmaker in England, he had begun to farm near Fincastle in southwestern Virginia. It was his farm in the arable foothills of the Appalachians which marked the beginning of a family tradition on the American frontier. George Kim had passed the agrarian spirit to his son Joseph, who in 1830 continued the family's westward migration by moving from Virginia to the cheap government land near Richmond, Indiana. Madison Kim, the second of Joseph's 12 children, married in 1836 and then struck out for the wilds of western Indiana to make his own home. Unfortunately, he tarried along the way at Hagerstown, Indiana, hoping to make money by working on a canal being built from there to Cincinnati. When the canal boom burst, Madison Kim traded his farm near Hagerstown for a sawmill, which burned to the ground only three weeks after he took possession. In the next few years, Madison Kim worked at various jobs in an attempt to recoup his finances. It was in the midst of this precarious frontier situation that on November 13, 1855, Omer Madison Kim was born. As the last of eight children, Omer Kim learned quickly that life's struggle on the frontier had both its rewards and hardships. Since his father had settled down to the carpenter's trade in Hagerstown, Omer spent his first decade in a small town which, like him, was just getting started in life. His flaming red hair, coupled with a red-hot temper, made him a party to many a boyhood scrape. At the age of five, zestful for adventures and intrigues, he accompanied several playmates on a train ride in an empty boxcar, chased out by a brakeman when 12 miles from home... Omer enjoyed neither the long walk back on an empty stomach nor the sound thrashing he received at its end. Nevertheless, he always found something new to do, even though it was often at the price of firm discipline applied to his posterior. And having made his entrance into the world in 1855, his lust for adventure found new fascination in the events which complemented his growing pains. Some of Omer's first memories were of the exciting days of the Civil War. He grew up in a family deeply committed to the Northern cause, for opposition to slavery had been a factor in his grandfather's decision to move from Virginia to Indiana. And while abolitionist Joseph Kemp had remained a Democrat, Omer's father, Madison Kemp, quickly joined the new anti-slavery Republican Party. He had proudly supported its first successful presidential candidate, Abraham Lincoln, in his war against secession. 
Little Omer idolized those youths old enough to don the blue uniforms and march southward from tiny Hagerstown. And most important of all, he became imbued with a strong loyalty to the political party which led the nation to victory. The end of the Civil War in 1865 brought a rebirth of both the agrarian and frontier tradition in Omer's family. His father once more decided to strike out for the West, this time to Missouri. Omer's uncle farmed there, and Madison Kemp saw a chance to give up carpentry and return to his first choice of farming. The family traveled by train, passing the nights in blankets spread out on the station house floors, and soon arrived in the new promised land, but three days was enough to convince Madison Kemp that he could serve his family interests better back in Indiana than in the chaotic border state of Missouri. So, with bags still packed from the original trip, Omer and the family returned to the Hoosier State. After the abortive jaunt further west, the Kemp family settled down on a rented farm near Luray, Indiana, where Omer received his first significant formal education. He received his first schooling at the Science Hill Schoolhouse and spent enough time there to learn the three R's thoroughly. Yet, like most farm boys of his day, he could go to school only during the three or four winter months when chores were less demanding. As a result, his real education was in the practical work on the family farm. By the time Omer Kem was 13, he had become well acquainted with the rigorous demands of the agrarian life. Most of his brothers and sisters were either married or working on their own, and Omer was the one son still available to help his father in the fields. The result was an early inculcation of the ideals of the American yeoman, a sturdy independence derived from a life contingent only upon personal industry and a plot of ground, plus the belief that the independent farmers were collectively the backbone of society. These ideals learned in life's school would guide Kem's future course. Because he was called upon to do the work of a man, young Omer made especially early attempts to prove himself. One opportunity came when the Lake Erie and Western Railroad, which ran near the Kem farm, celebrated its completion by sending out a keg of whiskey for free public consumption. The 13-year-old drank until he became sick and then received a parental thrashing which only added to his misery. From that day on, Omer Kem categorically refused the evil juice and later became a prohibitionist. He could prove his manhood more comfortably by doing the man-sized job required of him on his farm. He found this to be challenge enough. Indeed, Omer Kem came to derive positive pleasure from rural life. The freedom which it permitted had much to do with the development of his independent mind. Omer Kem and his father were their own masters, and it was up to them to do the work that would keep the family fed and housed. The boy enjoyed relative freedom once his chores were completed, and the chance to own and care for his own horse named Rowdy gave him both a means of travel and the pride of a personal possession. Whether young Omer made his weekly trip to nearby Springport for the supplies and the mail, or just went visiting relatives and chums, he learned to love the liberty which agrarian life bestowed. Omer Kim's adolescent years developed a spirit of independence that he would never fully control. Omer's youthful enthusiasm for adventure usually took him away from home. Since he was the only youngster around, and thanks to Rowdy, he spent much of his spare time visiting with his married sisters. Elmira Kem Stonebreaker and her husband James entertained him often, and he returned the favor by helping with the farm work there. In 1871, when Omer was 15, his father and James Stonebreaker decided to move northwest to the wilder and cheaper lands in Huntington County on the Wabash River. There, in the slashes of Indiana, Omer Kem obtained his final two winters of schooling. He spent the summer of 1872 helping his father work the leased land, and that winter he made his last three-mile walk to school. After this, Omer struck out on his own, never again to live at home. As his first independent venture in life, he worked in the timber area of northern Indiana, doing everything from felling trees to hewing out barrel staves. He often returned to visit his family on the Stonebreaker farm, and on one of these trips met a young lady recently arrived from North Carolina. Nancy Lenora Benson had lost her father in the Civil War, and she and her mother had left the smoldering ruins of Sherman's devastating march to settle on the Indiana frontier in about 1871. 
She was a girl of slight build with a charming femininity and a radiant natural beauty. Omar Kim began to court her, at first because of a friend's dare, but the relationship soon blossomed into a depth of mutual love and understanding. For a young man, in the midst of starting his own life on the frontier, nothing would do better than the aid and companionship of a wife. So, on the evening of March 18, 1874, Omer Madison Kem took Nancy Lenora Benson as his wife in a ceremony performed by the pastor of the local United Brethren Church in the Benson home. With a team of horses that was only partly paid for, a plow, an old wagon, and a few household items, the young couple settled down in an old log cabin. Kim worked out the summer as a lumberjack and then purchased house logs for $6 with which he built their first real home. He built the new cabin on the Stonebreaker farm, and with Nancy pregnant, Omer spent the last of his savings for a cow. Their first child was born here in December of 1874, but the boy died of cholera at the age of eight months. Kem helped work the Stonebreaker farm in the meantime, but this only meant immediate security for him with little hope for the future. In the fall of 1875, Omer Kem's father decided to return to eastern Indiana near Bluntsville. At the same time, the younger Kim decided to join the Stonebreaker family in a move westward within Indiana to the prairie lands near the Illinois border. On land near the town of West Lebanon, James Stonebreaker rented 100 acres, which proved to be enough for two men and two teams of horses to farm. In March of 1876, the two families moved their belongings to the newly leased farm. Omer Kem sold his log cabin on the past year's crop and hoped with the proceeds to support his family until the next year's harvest. He left his again pregnant wife with her mother, but after she gave birth on March 11, 1876, to a daughter, Maud, she joined him on the Indiana Prairie. The Kems soon found that they had merely transferred to a new location the hand-to-mouth existence of their first home. Lacking capital with which to buy land, they had again become renters. The tract that Omer Kem and James Stonebreaker rented cost them a yearly rental of $4 an acre. A good yield of corn was essential to their success, and yet interminable rain fell on the Indiana Prairie in the summer of 1876. Their crop was a total failure. Omer Kem, having already sold his only cow in order to pay for medical expenses, now had to sell one of his horses to pay his share of the rent. Then, with the coming of March 1877, James Stonebreaker died, and Omer Kem gave up the jointly rented farm. For the next two years, he and his family scratched out an existence on rented farms. With plenty of muscle and no money, Kem traded a ditch-digging job for a neighbor's cow, but by the fall of 1878, with poverty ruling the Kem family, Omer Kem decided to take what he later called a vacation. He packed the family and some of their belongings into the farm wagon and set out on a 250-mile trip back to eastern Indiana for the winter. The trip took six days, but the visit with relatives lasted for two months. In March, the moving month for tenant farmers in search of newer and better opportunities, Omer Madison Kem returned to western Indiana to begin working his fifth rented farm in as many years. And in the meantime, a second daughter, Melinda Ann, was born, further increasing his responsibilities. Yet, he still had to struggle along on a hand-to-mouth basis, totally depending on the annual harvest as a means of survival. In 1880, Kem moved out of the state of Indiana, this time settling on a tenant farm near Danville, Illinois. Even though he rented less than 100 acres, this proved too much for him to handle. So he sublet half of it to his wife's cousin, George Russom, and then settled down to two years of farming in the same location. The first year, 1880, brought a good crop and also a male heir who died shortly after birth. Nevertheless, there were still four mouths to feed at the Kem table. Omer Kem had little economic security to show for his labors and could hope for little more in the future as long as he spent half of his time in the fields working to pay the rent. He needed permanence and security, but the 
obtained both was through the ownership of his own farmland. Thus, by his second year on the Illinois farm, Omer Kem began to think in terms of the traditional farmer's panacea, a plot of land that he could call his own. For him, it became the solution to his pauper status as well as the key to the cornucopia of nature. In October of 1881, Kem thus gave eager attention to the news that the Otto Indian Reservation in southeastern Nebraska would be thrown open to settlers in two months. He believed that federal law would permit him to homestead some of the land or perhaps to buy it for $1.25 an acre. He thought that for the same amount as it cost him to rent 50 acres of land each year, he could buy outright ownership in 160 acres of unbroken government land. But time was of the essence, and this chance of a lifetime would not wait. By the middle of November, he and a neighboring farmer, Frank Blankenship, decided to strike out a loan to survey the situation in Nebraska. Their families stayed behind to reduce travel expenses and as protection in the event that the expedition proved a failure. Kem believed that he had nothing to lose, but on the other hand, he had failed to make sure that he had something to gain. He would seek cheap or free land, even at the risk of going on a wild goose chase from eastern Illinois to Nebraska. On Thanksgiving Day of 1881, Omer Madison Kem and his neighbor and trained for Beatrice, Nebraska, which was near the Otto Indian Reservation. Aboard the train, he learned that the lands in question had long since been rented to settlers and that they would now be auctioned off to the highest bidder. Thus ended his dream of a farm at a bargain price, and the chase appeared to be at an end before it really even started. But at the same time, Kem learned that government lands were still available in the Loop River country northwest of Kearney, Nebraska, Having come this far, the would-be farmer owner decided to change the destination of his three-fifths fair land inspection ticket from Beatrice to Kearney and try again for a bargain. Upon arriving in Kearney, Cam and his friend met two men from newly organized Custer County who assured them that government land was open in the area. So the two travelers got a ride in a wagon and after a two-day trip reached the Muddy Creek country of Custer County. Its chief settlement, the new town of Broken Bow, consisted of two sod buildings. One housed a general store and the other sheltered the local blacksmith. At the time, the county consisted largely of cattle ranches, but in the 1880s, its population, like that of the entire state, would triple because of the influx of such homesteaders as Omer Madison Kem. The new promised land, as Kem saw it in the late fall of 1881, was a grassy tableland rolling into the eastern edge of the Sand Hill and cattle country. The Muddy Creek drained the Custer County area before flowing into the Loop River and thence into the Platte. Near the creek were several canyons, which yielded anything from scrub timber to choke cherries. The land itself was virgin soil with not a thing on it but grass, gophers, and prairie chickens. Yet Cam could count as advantages the easy access to water and wood, the apparent fertility of the earth, and above all, the availability of free title under the federal land laws. Within a week after his arrival in Custer County, Omer Madison Kem and his companion each filed claims to 320 acres of table land. Kem selected 160 acres under the provisions of the Homestead Act of 1862 and an additional 160 acres adjoining the homestead under the Timber Culture Act of 1873. The entire claim lay about three and one half miles northwest of Broken Bow, which shortly became the seat of Custer County. After making application for the land and paying the small filing fee, Cam and Blankenship rode the Star Route mail buckboard back to Kearney and took the train from there to eastern Illinois. The entire trip had taken just two weeks and for the young man of 26 it had meant the launching of a new life whose heights would know no limits. 320 acres of land that he could call his own awaited him in Nebraska, and Omer Kem lost little time in making the final preparations for his most significant move west with the American frontier. The great distance involved meant that once settled in Nebraska, there would be little chance of returning to the Indiana home. The only possible exception would be if Omer Kem met with failure in his new endeavor, but even then his temperament would hardly allow an open admission of defeat. 
Kim therefore sent his wife and the children with his father, who had come to take them home to eastern Indiana. Nancy was again pregnant, and he knew that she would be safer at home while he made the final preparations for the move to Nebraska. He sold everything which he could not take west and then packed the household goods and the few pieces of farm equipment he owned, making arrangements for shipment by railroad in the spring. With his job completed, Omer Kemp joined his wife and family in Indiana for the final farewells. While there, he again became a father with the birth on January 27th of 1882 of Claude Julian Kim. The Kims would thus bring two girls and an infant boy with them to the Western Plains. Because of the economic necessity of raising a crop to support his family, Kim wished to move to his Nebraska land in time for the planting season, but his wife, Nancy, had developed eye trouble and a severe cold, and in addition, their new baby had become seriously ill. So, Kim decided to go ahead alone and call for his family after he had built a house and tested the Nebraska sod. In March of 1882, Omer Madison Kemp left the Hoosier State with a heart full of worries, but with the necessity of ensuring a living for his growing family. He had arranged to have his neighbor, Frank Blankenship, ship his family belongings by train from Illinois, since Kemp would take the train from Indiana. At Kearney, he met Blankenship, reclaimed the Kemp possessions, and hauled them with his own team and wagon northwest of the first farm he ever owned. By March 6th of 1882, Kim found himself in the midst of 320 acres of Nebraska sod, which had never seen a plow. He had a team of mares, one plow, a wagon, some necessary household goods, and less than $100 in his pocket. But he now had his own land in addition to the two necessary attributes for frontier farming, a strong back and a sturdy constitution. The first thing that he did upon arrival was to write his wife that he had made a safe journey and that everything was going well. Next, he set out to break the sod on his land and also rented 23 acres of cultivated land to ensure some security for that year's harvest. Kem's neighbor, James D. Ream, rented him the land and took him in while he was busy building his first sod house on the claim. In building sod houses, Kem and his fellow settlers made a necessary adaptation to life on the plains. As on earlier frontiers, the pioneers had used logs to build their cabins, so the Nebraska homesteader used local materials to replace the scarce timber. The result was the sod house, constructed on, of the one raw material that was readily available to provide a quick and economical means of obtaining shelter. Kem's first step in constructing a home for his family was to select a firm patch of blue stem sod on his farm and to plow it into foot-wide strips. He cut each strip into two-foot lengths and stacked them so as to form walls for his soddy, which were two feet thick and 16 by 24 feet long. Kem framed the door and two windows with wood and also used some of the little timber available for the ridge pole and rafters which supported the sod roof. When finished, his sod house boasted windows of glass or greased paper and a coating of plaster like gypsum on the interior walls. The house offered protection from the elements but also discomfort from the vermin living in the sod. In addition, a real danger existed in the enormous weight created by the roof when waterlogged by rain. But thanks to extra timber supports, Kim escaped the latter risk. By June of 1882, he welcomed his wife and family to their new home in Nebraska. After an exceedingly wet and cold spring, Omer Madison Kem had established himself in good fashion. He had 25 acres of plowed land on his own claim, a tubular well sunk for fresh water, plenty of wood cut and hauled from the canyons, and some extra provisions and cash earned by hauling merchandise from Kearney for the storekeepers in Broken Bow. On one of these trips made during the following winter, he brought the first safe to the growing metropolis of Broken Bow. The safe weighed about 5,500 pounds, and carrying it by horse and wagon to the office of the county treasurer earned $100 for Kem. 
With cash in his pockets and the fruit of an excellent harvest stored away, Omer Medicine Kem had finally made some headway in his struggle for agrarian success. Kem helped to lay not only the secular but also the religious foundations of Custer County. During his first summer in Nebraska, he aided in establishing a Sunday school which met on his homestead until the building of a church in Broken Bow. Kem himself had grown up as a Methodist and his grandfather, Joseph Kem, had been a licensed exhorter in that faith. In the 1840s, however, the Kems had come under the influence of the spiritualist excitement which had swept the country in the wake of the strange experiences of the Fox Sisters of Rochester, New York. Joseph Kem had regarded spiritualism as the work of Satan and had once attempted to order out of the house the evil spirit whom he held responsible for the inexplicable movements of a table. But both Joseph's son and grandson knew of the story, with the result that a family tradition developed concerning the mysteries of the spirit world. For Omer Kem, spiritualism would later offer an escape from the unwelcome bonds of formal religion. As he himself admitted, he had too much pride of intellect to bow wholly to the teachings of any minister or church. He continually asked questions, engaged in religious arguments, and pointed to what he deemed absurdities in the Bible. He disputed the right of any preacher to call him a sinner when he himself did not know what he had ever done wrong. Though he continued for a time to worship with his wife and family in the local United Brethren Church, he was fast becoming a deist in his approach to divinity and a spiritualist in his personal attitude towards religion. The year of 1883 brought personal tragedies which might well have turned Kem's mind more toward the mysticism of the occult. While Sari smiled again on his crops, Pluto struck at his family. In July, he received word of his mother's death. Then in October, his wife and children caught typhoid fever. With only one doctor in the county, medical care depended mainly upon frontier cures, but these were not enough. And on October 25, 1883, Nancy Kim succumbed to walking typhoid, leaving three equally sick children for their father to nurse back to health. At a time when Omer Kem could finally make a well-earned grasp at happiness, the burdens of life had once more strayed his hand. Totally out of funds and without an opportunity to hire a woman to care for the children, Omer Madison Kem donned the apron over his work clothes to become father, mother, nurse, and provider to his children. On one occasion, he made an attempt to make cookies for them, only to end with a sticky mess of dough in his hands and the words of disgust, Dad, I rot this stuff. But the years following the death of Nancy Kem were far more grim than humorous. To survive, Kem traded his 160-acre timber claim for a team of horses, some nursery stock, and a small amount of cash. Later, he sold the stock, rented his homestead, and worked at odd jobs in Broken Bow. He was in desperate straits. But he refused to give up and admit defeat. In the winter of 1884 to 1885, Kem arranged to have friends care for his children while he worked at $20 a month as a sheep herder for one of his neighbors. Spring brought Aunt Polly Woodley to the precariously perched but proud Kem household to help her deceased niece's husband raise the children. While a stern taskmaster to the children, she helped Omer Kem get back on his feet and into the fields. In the spring and summer of 1885, while out attempting to sell books and household utensils to his neighboring farmers, Kem found a new parent for his brood. He began to court Alice Maria Lockhart, who had recently come from Lima, Ohio, to live with her married sister. The young girl soon learned to respect and love this rugged farmer, 11 years her senior, and soon Omer Kem asked for her hand in marriage. On November 22, 1885, they were married at her sister's home in the small town of Myrna near Broken Bow. It proved to be the beginning of a 56-year covenant of mutual love and harmony. In the meantime, on October 24, 1885, Omer Medicine Kem had made a payment of $200 on his 160-acre homestead under the provisions of the federal law which specified either five years of residence or the payment of $1.25 an acre after three years as final proof of ownership. Undoubtedly, the main reason why Kim chose the latter method was to provide a collateral for borrowing money. Three days after making final proof on his homestead, 
Kem took a $600 mortgage at 8% annual interest on his farm. He needed the cash to cover his $200 payment on his land, but in addition, he had to purchase more farm equipment, build a small Saudi barn, and buy a new team of horses to replace the old team which he had brought from Illinois and which had since died. But most important of all, Omar Kem wanted to build a new and bigger sod house for his new bride. Thus, at the close of 1885, Omer Madison Cam had reestablished himself and earned a new lease on life. For this frontier farmer, life had brought intermittent moments of joy and heartache. He had carried on his family's tradition by cultivating the agrarian spirit and by moving ever westward. Omer Madison Kem's struggle with the soil had shaped a yeoman ready to face any challenge and confident that he would eventually succeed. Farm life did something to a man that mm, sustained his optimism, that stimulated independence and personal pride in his own industry, and it all together had developed him into a self-sufficient, pensive young man. Like many other 19th century farmers, Omer Madison Kem had sought his fortune on the frontier, and his experiences had typified the homesteader's hope and heartbreak. The lessons he had learned during his first 30 years could make him a fitting spokesman for his millions of fellow agrarians. And that is the end of chapter one of Omer Madison Kem, The People's Congressman. Please like and subscribe and join us next for chapter two, Transition and Turbulence. Please go to the next video.